Mr. Hayton, how are you, man? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, good, good. Um, this is this is take two. This is quite the um, the setup that we've got going on here with a shit ton of <laughs> troubleshooting. Yeah. Um, which I which I thought might be kind of interesting just to actually sort of lay out to. I mean, given that the audience is um, that of filmmakers and and what have you, we've got. So we're running this through Audition. I've got sound going into Audition, sound going into Zencaster simultaneously. I'm recording the video on my phone whilst talking to you <laughs> on Skype with the headphones in, which I don't <laughs> normally do on the podcast in order to prevent feedback. Yeah. So it's, and then and then we were just talking just then and Skype on my iPad cut out. So I'm yep. completely in the dark with, <laughs> no fucking idea of what was happening and and all that because normally well i probably wouldn't trust an internet connection anyway even though yeah. in australia i've got what australia considers to be the best internet which is mbn that the video quality is not that yeah. great which is yeah, why I think we're so. doing it this way so. yeah. but yeah. now especially Good with stuff. the lockdown <laughs> all right yeah my Take care. cuts out all right you too minutes. See ah all right, right. yeah there's no yeah i even like uh, i have some friends who are on the podcast a few months back and they did they they were supposed to do a big live show at the Melbourne Comedy Festival which got cancelled yeah so they decided to put it to put it online and do it live online and um they had a shit ton of problems with internet and what have you, as far as I'm aware. Yeah. But, um, anyway. Yeah. Plus so we've so got, we've, this is taken a, this is your first international episode as well, right? You're, you're the first man. Yay. <laughs> that's quite an honor. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, I think it's, I think it's, you're, you're the perfect guy to start with. This is something we, we touched on in our first attempt 10 minutes ago is you and I have known each other for 10 years now yeah. and we have only ever known each other through Facebook and Skype and what have you. We've never actually met in the past. That's true. That's true. It's quite strange. I think you're the only friend I have like that. Yeah. Where it's an actual pro yeah. an actual proper friendship and yet we've never actually met. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we've worked on things and we've like, you know, mused over different projects and what have you. And yeah bounced around ideas and that and it's and, and we got close to working together in the flesh once yeah and i had that potential job in portofino yeah 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 that's um, right yeah to, fuck, yeah I mean, that was so near yet so far a million years ago too yeah um so so yeah so this is because normally you know big wonder is is very much about and it's not like I'm because I'm not from Melbourne, so I can't say, "Oh, this is a, a podcast, you know, strictly for for Melbourne talent." This is purely out of proximity that I would have uh, that I would only be talking to talent in Melbourne, um, right? Because I do really like the in the room conversation. But so, but but with everything that's happening, this is this is how it's got to be, yeah. even if they were across the street yeah this would be, be doing it like this you know yeah 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 absolutely yeah 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 have you done a podcast before try to think actually um i don't think i have actually no no i think this is my first yeah geez we're, we're smashing all kinds of firsts yeah <laughs> i've been on the radio but never on a yeah yeah cool. never on an actual podcast the radio is a trip too, right? Mm. You know, it's going out live mm. and you're not supposed to swear and there's things yeah. you can't talk about, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think the first time I was on the radio, I went out in, live in front of um, 10 million people. So no pressure. What? Yeah, it's 10 million people. Yeah. <laughs> is this BBC or something? BBC, like yeah. Yeah. Oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> what was that for? Oh, that was, uh, that was because I'd been involved in a... Uh, in a hackathon to help refugees and it was a bbc science show and they wanted to know what a hackathon was and what sort of stuff we've been doing yeah i want to know what a hackathon is okay so basically a hackathon is when you get a bunch of programmers entrepreneurs designers together in teams 
over a weekend and you feed them lots of pizza and beer and Coca-Cola and stuff like that and get them to hack together solutions to predefined problems. So in this particular case, we were trying to build digital products that could help um, refugees and people who'd been affected by conflict. Yeah, right. Yeah. How long ago was that? Uh, that was at the end of 2016, but I've done it many times since. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Most recently in Gaza, actually. I went to Gaza in December. Yeah. Uh, that, was a, that was for a hackathon. I mean... So let's just set the stage first so people um, know that I'm not just talking to one of my bros <laughs> because I've got no one else to talk to. We, we, know each other, <laughs> we know each other because you were primarily a photographer yeah. at your base. Yeah. Um, and then so a mutual friend of ours put us in touch because I was just stepping out into the world of photography mm. for the first time and, and we just started chatting that way. Yeah. Then you started um, making like music videos and short documentaries. And yeah, stuff, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, so I, creatively speaking, I started out as a photographer um, and then I I was doing that kind of on the side for a while and then I finally made a leap of faith and went full-time. This was in 2008 that I quit my day job. And so I was doing... Which was what? Uh, I was teaching. Yeah, I was a teacher and trainer right. for, for a few quite a few years um yeah and then doing photography on the side um and living in asia so i lived in japan and then i lived in malaysia um so my photography career was born in in east asia and um yeah so i was doing photography for quite a few years um and then around sort of 2011 2012 i started transitioning into into video and what was your um like transition into video where where did you first start out um well i was so after i left malaysia i moved to spain and uh mm -hmm. yeah because i wanted to be back in europe but i didn't want to move back to the uk uh just just yet mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, barcelona seemed like an interesting place um and it was but 2008 was around when the global financial crisis really kicked in and Spain was particularly badly mm. affected. So that was quite a tough period um, in my working life. Um, but <laughs> yeah, but one thing which I did right was I said, right, I'm going to be international from day one. And so every opportunity mm -hmm. I had, I, uh, I would, you know, get on a cheap flight or get on the bus or get on the train and just do a job somewhere, whether it was in France or Spain or the UK or sweden or wherever so i was able to build an in international network and build an international brand and just plant seeds all over the place and it was tough for quite a long time but over the years i developed a really uh, big international network and also a lot of international experience which has served me quite well ever since so so yeah and then i transitioned into video for a few reasons, really. Um, one was that, well, when I first started in photography, it was the sort of tail end of the film era. So I learned photography through film, um, right. as in 35 millimeter stills photography. Um, mm. And when I started doing paid shoots, it was around 2004, four five, people were starting to shoot digitally, but it was not a mature technology yet um and there was still a kind of magic to photography uh there was still a very high barrier to entry but i knew that digital was going to change everything and so i was always looking over my shoulder to see where the technology was going and what i needed to do to in order to stay ahead of the curve and be able to justify mm -hmm. my fee um <laughs> yeah. Uh, and obviously it completely trans transformed the industry in a lot of good ways, a lot of great ways. But I knew that for me, at least, the, I could see the writing on the wall because I didn't want to have to continue on that path. Um, or rather, to put it more precisely, I it was a it was a fight that I 
I wasn't in love with photography enough that I wanted to continue having to do that, uh, continually differentiating right. myself and continually, um, you, you know, uh, competing against people who are, you know, shooting on their iPhones and all this sort of stuff. I just, I just felt that that was a, a battle that I was kind of getting a bit done with, a bit, a bit tired of. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and the other thing was that I found video more filmmaking as an art, just more stimulating because it's more comp- complicated. And the other thing that I liked about mm-hmm. it was that it's more collaborative. There's very little that you can really do as a one man band. I liked working with directors of photography, sound guys and girls, editors, all that stuff. I like that collaborative effort. Um, and so I thought this was something that for me had a lot more mileage to it. So there you go. Right, 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 right. Yeah, cool, cool. And so uh, wh- when you when you made that transition, was it was it the sort of were you were you out there smashing out you know corporate videos or what was what was when you when you because you know we all have to sort of do like I shoot real estate mm. in order to do everything else that I want to do. Mm-hmm. And, and when I went into fashion, I was fortunate enough that I was still working in oil and gas. Yeah. So I never had to shoot shit that I didn't want to shoot. Yeah. And I was very happy to just keep building my portfolio for free and only shoot the shit that I yeah. wanted to do. So that's a different dynamic. But for you, what what was your, okay, I'm going to do video what, or I'm going to make whatever with film yeah you know moving pictures what what was it that your your what was your like ob- objective what did you really want to shoot and what did you have to do to supplement that okay so there's a lot to unpack there um <laughs> so firstly i think what you did was super smart um to have the security of a of a day job while you built up a portfolio that was very specialized um I followed a similar track with my with my photography. Um, it just took me a longer to figure that out, I think, <laughs> because in the beginning in in photography, I was shooting everything because I just loved photography, so right. I shot everything. And then yeah. when I realized that there was an opportunity to do it professionally, I took in the beginning I took every job that came along because I wanted to get the commercial mm-hmm. experience. But then I realized after, you know, a while that I really liked shooting portraits and anything to do with people. Uh, and I also show, I showed my por- portfolio to, to a, an Australian, actually, an Australian photographer, a guy called Palani Mohan. And he looked through my portfolio and he said, look, you know, this screams people. You should double down on this. And I think that's essential for any creative whether they are a photographer a filmmaker fashion designer sculptor whatever it is they need to specialize um because if you're shooting everything under the sun mm, that can work but it's very difficult to get known that way um yeah yeah no one knows what you're yeah is. yeah yeah it's all about it's about branding but it's also about um mastery because you only have a limited amount of time. So you may as well get really, really good at one thing rather than shooting loads of different stuff to a really mediocre standard. So, so that's the first thing. So when I went um, full-time professional in photography, that was I was highly specialized by that point. And I kept specializing as the years went by. I mentioned earlier the, th- the thing about digital transforming the industry. Well, I knew that I had to be highly specialized in order to remain relevant. Um, and then later when I wanted to transition into video, I already knew the importance of specialization, but also I already had a network. And so when I decided that I wanted to start doing video, it wasn't like I was starting from zero. I was able to piggyback mm. piggyback off my photography business and say, hey, to my trusted client, hey, I'm doing video now. Is that something that would interest you? So I offered it as an ec- yeah, an additional service. And that was how I got started with that. And then gradually I... So you're one... 
yeah, gradually I, I dialed down the photography and dialed up the video. And then over the years, added other right. other services to, to the business to make it more interesting and differentiated and unique. And then so back to back to the tail end of my original um, question, what did you hope that you would be known for shooting on uh, in moving pictures? Well, I think you got to I think there are t there are there are two uh, realities there. There's the stuff that you love shooting. And there's the stuff that the market <laughs> is interested in. And now, ideally, yeah. you want those two things to overlap as much as possible. And we've just talked about the importance Always. of having a, a strong brand. Um, now, when I, when I got started as a professional, that was quite difficult because the market was all messed up budgets were being cut left right and center and so uh the, you know we had the global financial crisis going on so there was there was the temptation to start shooting or you know just whatever was coming again mm -hmm. i managed i managed to resist that temptation um by going and getting a part-time job again because mm -hmm. i didn't want to compromise my work to the extent where I was basically just a jack of all trades. Um, and so sometime, I think it was, yeah, around the beginning of 2009, I started doing some teaching and training work again for a while just to tide me over. So that was able to then um, focus my creative work and my professional work in the same domain. Mm. And again, it was very people focused. Um, Living in Barcelona, I had quite a lot of opportunities to shoot fashion. Um, I never really would have described myself as a fashion photographer or a fashion filmmaker. But what I liked about shooting mm -hmm. fashion was that I was able to gain an, uh, an understanding of the importance of things like styling and wardrobe and makeup, mm. which I'd known a little bit about before, but, um, but not enough. Um, and anyway, to get to the point, the domain in which I ended up specializing in was shooting uh, stories for technology companies. And the reason why I did that, advertising for technology companies. So the reason why I did that was because I recognized that whilst it was a lot of fun to shoot, um, you know, fashion stuff and music videos because I did quite a few of those when I was living in Barcelona. Um, I, I, didn't, I didn't love it enough in order to make that my, my sort of full-time gig. Um, and mm -hmm. I, I've always been very interested in, in technology. Um, and uh, when I was studying, I did quite a bit of maths and physics and, and that sort of thing. Um, and I've always liked to combine my arty side with my more technical, analytical, sciencey side. And mm -hmm. I realized that technology companies very often, uh, or technologists, are technical by nature and often not all that good at the creative side of things. And so I spotted yeah, they're a lacking in the art. Department. They're very much lacking in the art department, and so. I, the, the the James Cameron type characters are few and far between. Most definitely, most definitely, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, so, yeah. I I realized that there was an opportunity there to to really, really um, specialize and become known for somebody as somebody who could help technology companies bring their ideas to life and tell their stories in a powerful, engaging, and interesting way. And so I was able to leverage my experience of shooting fun, creative stuff, portraiture and fashion and music videos, and take that creativity and apply it in an area that is typically known as being, being a bit nerdy. Um, and be able to speak their language. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. yeah. Which is a massive asset. Yeah. yeah. 
for sure. Yeah. Um, and so, but you, but you've, I mean, obviously, you know, I've, as, as we, we mentioned before, I've known you for 10 years, so I know that you're, I feel like you're not shooting as much these days anymore and you've transitioned sort of almost back into an educational type realm. Is that fair to say? Um, I'm certainly not shoot because you were, did a TED talk recently, and you're doing yeah, all kinds of shit. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Um, I'm certainly not shooting much stills anymore. Um, I I'd, I'd like to do more of that, but honestly, with stills photography, I I got to the point where I was, and I hate to say it, but I was just a, a little bit sick of it. Um. Because mm. when it's all you do for, for such a long time, unless it is your it's your path, um, mm. then you know it can get it can get a bit tiring. And I realized that it wasn't my path. It was for a while, but um, you know, I felt much more much more comfortable with, with filmmaking ultimately. Um, I still shoot um, quite a lot of of videos. Um, but I would describe my role now in the creative domain as, as that of a creative director, um, with a heavy specialization in filmmaking, but I see filmmaking these days as a, as a language. So mm -hmm. sometimes my clients need me to use that language because they have they have a story that they need to tell, which is best told through making a video. But equally, it might also require producing an animation. Um, because one thing which we haven't touched on yet is that I have a lot of experience in that domain as well. Um, and yeah, probably, yeah, for almost 10 years now, I've been doing, doing quite a bit of, of animation, motion graphics, um stuff like that um and again that's just another language and sometimes mm -hmm, that is mm -hmm. the best language yeah sometimes that's the that's the best language to tell a particular kind of story mm -hmm. um especially at the moment where they can't employ anyone to actually come <laughs> be the actor yeah before, yeah very you much know, so you just you just, see the just make it sudden explosion of animation yeah <laughs> yeah yeah precisely yeah and then the um but then the other the other side of that is that sometimes I tell the story myself with my own voice. Mm. So right. So for um, the last few years, I've been doing a lot of talks, um, panel discussions, conference presentations. I did a TEDx talk a couple of months ago as well. Um, ultimately, what it boils down to is that I'm a storyteller. I like telling stories. I love ideas. Um, whether I'm telling my own stories or whether I'm telling somebody else's stories, that's the thing that I'm really that I mm -hmm. that I really love. And it's taken time to realize that that is my essential purpose, and it's manifested itself in different ways over the years through through photography, through teaching, through filmmaking, animation. Um, but, but ultimately I just see those forms of expression as different languages. Um, and, uh, it's fun. It's fun to have a few different creative and communicative languages in my toolbox and then just pick the one that is appropriate to that particular story. So as, um, because I've, I've seen bits and bobs of your stuff over the year, mm -hmm. over the years, I think the fa my favorite or surprisingly the one that had the most effect on me and I reached out to you mm -hmm. um was the the film that you made of people rolling um Br uh, Brazilian jiu jitsu people rolling and I was like I think it was judo actually I'm using the right term. <laughs> judo yeah. right and just the way that you 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 edited that and put that together mm. with the use of slow mo and what have you uh, yeah I know that I thought it was really really powerful Yeah was that the Adidas one Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that was a great project. That was a great, great project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because it ticked all the boxes. 
Um, it's and we've talked already about the importance of aligning things. Um, and it's quite rare that you have a commercial project that ticks all the boxes. And that was one of them because um, I've been doing judo my whole life. And uh, I had the opportunity to go to Georgia and follow the men's judo team preparing for the World Judo Championships. And so we spent a week just embedded with them, uh, watching them train, interviewing them, um, flying drones over the mountains and just loads of crazy stuff. Um, it was incredibly intense. And How so? well, because we went there with a skeleton crew. Um, in fact, you didn't even really have a crew. I did everything. <laughs> well, that's not quite true. <laughs> I did everything in terms of the actual filming. And then there was another guy there who was uh, the photographer, but he was also an experienced filmmaker. So he helped me out a lot in terms of setting up the cameras and stuff. And then there was a producer who was with us who, who orchestrated everything and who could also speak Georgian. So that, that helped a great deal. But to have three people pull off what we pulled off it is well i wouldn't recommend it put it that way <laughs> uh yeah i was dragging about 30 kilos worth of gear around around um often shooting oh, yeah. in three or four locations in one day having to set up very quickly and you know just keeping everything rolling over the course of seven days is really really tough so it's like 18 hour days every day for i think about six days in total yeah shit yeah it was madness and how do, how does that all come together in terms of you know not not how did you get the job but once you get the job who has someone storyboarded that have they yeah. written out the essence like a all of that and you just take that and interpret it or did they get you to come up with the whole the story the underlying subtext all that sort of stuff yeah um so we had Okay, well, <laughs> firstly, ordinarily, if you're doing a job like that, of course, you would spend quite a lot of time preparing it, scripting it, storyboarding it, all that sort of thing, so that you hit the ground running and know, know essentially what you want to get in the can. Um, this project... A lot of it had to be done on the fly because these guys were preparing for one of the most important events of their lives. We could not mm -hmm. dictate where they would be and when. It was the other way around. It was like, right, well, we're going to be at the National Training Center between these hours, right? So if you want to film us, fine. But we couldn't even fly really... Ver yes, it was fly on the wall, but to produce commercially viable content. So it was it was essentially guerrilla filmmaking, but with a fly on the wall documentary kind of aspect to it. Um, and then you throw into that the fact that, you know, we were also shooting with a very, very, um, well, basically no real crew, lots of, changes in the schedule, um, certain amount of, um, uh, how could I put it? Um, well, Georgia's not the easiest place to travel around. The roads are terrible. The driving is awful. <laughs> um, so, you know, a lot of the time we're sort of throwing gear in the back and, you know, speeding along these winding roads and then having to unpack and getting the drone ready, getting the camera set up for just like a few minutes of action. Um, it was, it was pretty wild. Um, and it was exhausting, but amazing. Like one of the best experiences of my life. And I think that excitement comes through in the, in the content. So, so yeah, we, we did a good job there. You could tell it was full of passion. There's no, there's no, I think I told you, it, I brought me to tears actually, which I was so surprised about when it's just, it was like listening to, the same but not the same you know i was viewing it yeah i, I, can't, I think you had music to it but mm. it was like listening to an instrumental piece that was <laughs> you know just 
I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I really, 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 and and because I'm not at that point when I watched it, um, I've since changed my opinion. But I wasn't very into the martial arts yeah. world. Um, and I was. Pro- I can't remember how long ago did you make it? Oh, uh, um, it was a couple of years ago. Yeah. Yeah, I might have been out of oil and gas at that point, but there was a period there where I just associated thugs with, you know, MMA and fucking all of that crap. Yeah. Was, you know, the, the, the sort of try. Here we go. My fucking laptop reckons it's going to die. Oh, no. <laughs> so, well, we'll see how we go. Okay. Uh, just hold on two seconds. Yeah. Tom, let me see if I. Well, it says it's still plugged in, so. Okay. It might go, it might not. Right. We'll have to re- reconvene. But anyways, so, yeah, I loved it. I thought it was great. Thank you. What, um, in terms of what's been the pinnacle as a filmmaker for you? What's your proudest piece and, and how did it all happen? Um, hmm. Or is that it? <laughs> it's certainly up there. But look, I mean... And there's a bit there's a bit of a martial arts connection here. Whatever I shoot, whatever I shoot, it doesn't matter whether it's something super cool like going to Georgia for a week and filming the national judo team. Whether it's something like that, or whether it's something that something quote unquote boring, like I don't know, interviewing a banking executive or something like that i say boring in scare quotes quotes it's what i mean is that it could be perceived that way by a typical audience um no matter what i'm shooting whether it's something that is or would typically be perceived of as super cool like going to georgia for a week and filming the national judo team whether it's something like that or whether i'm filming an interview with a banking executive I want to sh- want to do the best I possibly can every single time I shoot every single time because if I can't bring everything if I can't show up with a hundred percent for the shoot there is no point in me being there and I can't give what I need to give to deliver good results unless it's a hundred percent and there i think that 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 attitude has been influenced by martial arts in the sense that when you're training in judo or brazilian jiu-jitsu which i also do um if your mind is somewhere else or if you're not a hundred percent focused in the moment then you're going to get beat yeah you're going to get beaten yeah so you have to be fully present. And so, of course, there are some jobs that I enjoy more than others. But in general, I try not to take them on unless I know that I can give 100% to it. So there's a lot of stuff that, mm. I, that, I, that I turn down these days because, mm, because I know that I'm not the right person for it somebody else would be would, yeah, would do yeah, do a better yeah. job so with all of that being said yes of course the georgia experience is something i'll never forget that was really really special um it's a lot of boxes yeah it ticks it ticks a lot of boxes but but it's it's it it's something that i i would have been really passionate about doing anyway Even if I hadn't got paid, (laughs) it would have been something that I would have been very interested in doing, you know, so, Mm -hmm. so yeah. And you've never, I mean, you and I dabbled with a script once. Yeah. Um, It's funny actually, because (laughs) I've spoken about Lauren a lot on this podcast. Yeah. um, Because it's, it's an ever going thing. Yeah. Um, But you know, originally, this uh, this is actually a nice little segue to make because originally yeah. when I first had that little nugget of an idea of a guy waking up from a dream yeah, and I was going to 
I think I was asking you, how could I film this in a 30 second clip? Yeah. And you're like, oh, that's, that's, that's I'm sure it was in that conversation that you suggested, oh, well, what if this? And then we both sort of went down this road of, well, what if, what if he wakes up and there's a body next to him? Or uh-huh. what if his dream does this? Or what if when he's walking around the house, this happens and then all of a sudden you and I decided you were going to come to New York and we were going to shoot this thing. Yeah. Um, and we were, and we were looking at how the fuck we were going to make this happen. And we didn't even have a script. We were just <laughs> try and just fucking kamikaze something on the fly yeah. and, and get it done. And then of course that never happened. Both you and I was fucking skint. And fucking <laughs> yeah. Morning. I remember that. <laughs> um, <laughs> um and and it got tabled and then I got home and I started going back to see and then I think I think you dialed out at that point and handed over the reins to Trevor. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Trevor stepped in. Yeah, and um cuz you had never done anything I, th- I think that's still the case that is fictitious narrative to that sort of extent like no, a short film or anything. Not really, no. I mean, yeah. I mean, I've worked, I mean, most of the commercial stuff I shoot is scripted. Um, but yeah, most mm-hmm. of the narrative stuff that I've done is with music videos. Yeah, mm-hmm. where there's a yeah. there's a narrative, but there isn't any dialogue. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then, so Trevor and I worked on this for a little bit. And we got it right up to pre-production where we had a director, an editor, and a, and, and a production company. Yeah. And then um, Trevor cracked the ads about something, so I got rid of him. <laughs> and, <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> and what happened at that point? I want to say that we still had the basis of what Trevor had written, and that was a five-page script. Yeah. And... And then the money got pulled and I couldn't shoot it and it and it fucking went back onto the hard drive. Yeah. For like another two years. Yeah. And then and and then a friend of mine, Liam Lacey, stepped in and wrote like a fifteen page script expansion. And obviously we went on to shoot it. And then after my big shitstorm with the guys who uh, I made it with, you stepped back in <laughs> yeah. to try and edit it. And we had this real serendipitous um, um, event where your uncle was on his way yeah. to see the ho- a family reunion. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and I was able to get in the hard drive. Yeah, yeah. And then, but once again, just like just like we were when we first hatched the idea back in New York, work was slim, money was slim, and um, I think we got about two months into it and. And then, so then it, I had to, then, 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 then nothing happened again. Yeah. We had a little bit of a, a play with it and then it fucking well, dust again for eight months. I think it's, I, I think, uh, I, I think it's worth, um, for your audience, uh, going down a bit of a technical road here because there were some interesting features of that footage where I think that there's a useful lesson to be learned. Um, mm. so yeah, I, I had an attempt at putting a, a first cut together of the footage. And my impression was that the footage was really beautiful. It was really beautifully shot. It was very powerful, great performance from you and from, from Nick, um, and the other actors, I'm sorry, I don't know their names. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but and I, I say this with no no disrespect towards the 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 the, uh, the, the crew and the director, yeah, the guys involved. But there was yeah. one thing, there was one thing that they did which made it an absolute nightmare to edit, and that was the fact that the director kept calling cut right after the actor had finished doing their bit. Now, mm. sometimes that's okay but the problem with that the problem with saying cut as soon as the the shot is ended is that you leave no breathing space for the editor 
So if I'm make, you know, making a speech or whatever, delivering a monologue, whatever it is, blah, 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 blah. Cut. When you're editing that, it's very abrupt and you've got no space between the end of that performance and then the next shot. Sometimes it doesn't matter, but as a general rule, if you're directing, you need to say cut with a little bit of a buffer at the end. So give it one second, two seconds, mm -hmm. three seconds. It costs you nothing, but it can save you oodles of time in the editing suite. And so when I was sort of trying to put a first cut together, um, it was very challenging because all the, all the different shots were too tightly wedged together and there was no breathing space between them. Now, it's not impossible. If you've got a lot of good B-roll and all that stuff, there's cutaways, there's tricks that you can use to sort of build a, a kind of film sandwich, but it takes a lot more work. So yeah, that's that's why, or one reason why, if you if you're a director, it's super useful to have at least basic editing skills and vice versa. Because then as a mm. as a director, you understand the editor's perspective. And then as an editor, you understand the director's perspective. I think this is I mean, it's such a good thing that you bring up and, and, and let me just backtrack for two secs and say um, the reason that I spoke about our re-involvement in the film was just to sort of highlight and something we talk about a lot on this podcast is, you know, the projects that come through that are a breeze and the projects that come through that aren't yeah. the ones that just go seamlessly uh, of course, by far the best, but they are the rarest. Mm. It's often the case where it's a fucking struggle. Yeah. Because there's just so many moving parts and, and creative differences and what have you. And, and, and Lauren has certainly been a testament to that. Um, well, you kept going with it, though. But, I mean, if you think about well, it. Amazingly. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. You kept going. A lot, amazingly. A lot, of, a lot of people just give up. Um, and five years, yeah. five years now to make a 15 minute film. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it takes. <laughs> I hope, you know, this is, this is, I'll tell you what, I, I, I'll finish what I was going to say and then I'll, I'll, I'll finish this other section. But, um, I think it's really interesting because, because Big Wonder is based around people in pr pr predominantly, um, the filmmaking space yeah. who who never set out to be a filmmaker that the, for, for 95 percent of the people i spoke to i speak to they are actors or um predominantly actors who have now had to become the whole package in order for them to act in something and that's one of the things that you i mean it is worth its weight in gold in learning how everything works so that when you get out especially on the bigger productions and you know how things are going to yeah. come together and you know where the camera is and you know to give the sound guy a little heads up because you're going to try something new yeah. and it's going to be on the fly and he's going to have his levels ready for for whatever or she um levels are going to be all that kind of stuff so that you can own the space and be a joy to work with yeah um so I th that's it's such a valuable lesson. Um, but uh, what I was going to say, oh man, don't you hate that? <laughs> the other thing that I was going to say, no, it'll come back to me later. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. So so and now full circle, Lauren. I just saw the first cut. Yeah. The other day. And. Yeah, actually, I haven't spoken to <laughs> since I saw it. Yeah, man, it, it, it's so right now it's about 45 minutes long. Amazingly. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they got that much footage. There um, is a lot of footage. Yeah. Yeah. And it doesn't seem like I'm amazed that there's 45 minutes yeah. off an 18 page script with hardly any dialogue. Right. But there's, so there's plenty of stuff in there that is going to be trimmed and that doesn't need to be. Yeah. But I didn't feel necessarily um, that it was super draggy. But of course, I, I'm 
a bit um, disabled in that department. I can't, I'm looking at my baby, you know, yeah. I mean? so I'm engaged because it's this thing that I've worked on for so long and so hard yeah. to get up and running. But so that is a really interesting process too. Yeah. Is seeing this thing that you created and that you were so fond of and then seeing the shit in it that doesn't work. Mm. And you're like, oh, <laughs> God, when I was doing that at the time, I thought that was going to be really good. And now it looks like balls. Right. You know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. All right. Well, I look, for, I look forward to seeing it. Yeah, I'm intrigued to see what the next step is. Yeah. You know, there's some big notes being passed around between us on on what needs to happen and where it needs to go mm. it's it's followed the script you know you and i mused about really breaking it up and doing this kind of pulp fiction-esque style of editing with it but um mm. they've, they've they've taken the very linear approach to it which is you know it's following following the script as is which is great which is fine yeah um so yeah Stay tuned. Watch this space. I'm, I might have a, a finished film in another two years. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So listen, man. Uh, when when I called you the other day mm. and um, asked you to come on the podcast, there was there was one thing that we we wanted to eventually get to. Yeah. And that was you've been up to recently, and I'll let you unpack it as you say. Uh, how recently? Because for the last four weeks, I've <laughs> been. <laughs> yeah well i mean well you're working on you're working on this blog thing oh right 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 yeah 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 sure sure okay so um so i, I thought that was pretty poignant right yeah yeah so i'm actually writing an ebook about how freelancers can survive the pandemic and right. it originally started out life as a blog post and I kept writing and writing and writing and writing and adding all these different sections and stuff. And then I thought, this is not a blog post anymore. This is a short book. Um, and then I started speaking to various freelancers about, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of pains that they were going through. And, and I thought this is something that is actually going to be quite important for me to do. Um, so, so yeah, I've pretty much finished it now. It's taken me a few weeks to write it. I uh, need some editing. Um, and I'm having an artist um, do the illustration for the front cover. And then I'll be releasing it at some point in the next week or two. Yeah. Yeah. And it's and just to give you a bit more context, it was mm. born out of my experience in the global financial crisis because as i mentioned earlier in our, in our as i mentioned earlier in our mm. chat that was a really tough time to be a freelancer uh especially in spain which is where i was living at the time and a lot of the stuff that i did back then to get through that tough period is very relevant now and so in the book, I've adapted those principles for the situation that we are currently in. And like, where will this be presented and how will people gain access to it? And... Um, okay, that's a, that's a good question, actually. Um, well, I will be posting about it on my website. So anyone who goes to my website will be able to find it. At the time of recording this interview, I don't know exactly where it is it is going to be, but by the time we release it, <laughs> you should have a link that you can share with people if they if they want uh, to. Um, I yeah, think cool. I will probably release it on Kindle as well, um, but I haven't looked mm -hmm. into exactly how I would do that yet, but I want to get it out to as many people as possible. And what's the guts of it? You know what I mean? Give us a little bit of a... Um a snapshot of mm. what of what you would expect to to find in there okay um well there's it's broken down into sections so the first section is on mindset so it's about yep. coping with 
huge amounts of uncertainty, coping with um, having your income drop by huge percentages or even down to zero mm. in some cases, um, and how you can develop a more kind of fortified mindset to weather the economic storm. Um, there's another section on money. So how you can, how you can cut your costs and if necessary, um, and be a little bit more, um, strategic about how you manage and manage and deploy the financial resources that you have. Um, then the, the biggest, the longest section is on strategy. So that's very specific actionable points that people can take in order to protect their business and get new clients, deal with clients in this sort of environment, um, digitally transform your business so that if you're not able to actually physically, if you're doing something that requires physical presence, how can you overcome that obstacle by becoming more digital? Um, but it's very much focused on concrete, actionable, battle-tested tips that I've used myself over the last mm -hmm. 12 plus years uh, and not motivational fluff because I've seen quite a lot of that floating right. around on the yeah. internet. Um, and the fact is that... Keep your chin up. Oh, yeah, spam. <laughs> Seriously, like... <laughs> I mean, there's something to be said for that, but okay, yeah, you put your chin up and now what? What do you actually do? Yeah. So yeah. in the book, I give people very concrete tips on things that they can actually do, which will have an actual result. Result, yeah, yeah. 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 How can I be most effective? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that I mean, I can with, give you, let me, with, let me give you, let me give you some actual value here, right? Um, so we talked earlier about um, the importance of specialization and having a, having a niche. Um, now, in times of crisis, some people might be tempted to just grab every little bit of work that they that they can right um and that's understandable on one level but i actually think that in the mid to long run that is a big mistake um because in this sort of environment clients are still going to be spending money but they want to be sure that they're investing money in people who are highly specialized and who are going to be able to, who are the best person for the job. Mm. So there's an analogy that I really like. It's due to a guy called Michael Zapersky, who's a consulting guru. And he says, imagine you're a samurai going out into battle and you need to sharpen your sword. Would you go to a master swordsmith who only focuses on making and sharpening the best swords in town? Or would you go to an all singing, all dancing, jack of all trades blacksmith who does, I don't know, like kettles and pots and pans and sometimes dabbles in swords? Yeah. yeah. Obviously you'd go to the master no, sword. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. So the importance of specialization has never been more relevant. Mm. Which is which is an interesting thing if you bring it back to actors mm. and and it is the testament of a great actor who specializes in something and then makes a transition into another. Mm -hmm. And not only do they do they defy everyone's commentary before they do, but that you know, and then and then to make it profitable and successful like Bruce Willis stepping into the shoes of Die Hard, mm. you know, having been a comedic actor and oh, yeah. sitcoms and yeah, yeah. shit like that. That's everyone, true, yeah. Everyone boohooed him so badly yeah, yeah, yeah. that they had to change the poster and take his photo off the poster 
because uh, people were walking out of the cinemas and now we know how he's one of the, the old time action heroes. Yeah. And he's still funny as fuck as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I that's mean, true. Yeah, Tom Hanks is another prime example mm. of someone who's on Saturday Night Live doing shit like Big and um, what have you. And then all of a sudden he knocks out Philadelphia and you're like, huh? Yeah. You know, but, 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 but 100%, I get what you're saying. Um, but ha- well, I yeah, think I mean, that's, 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 that's a really, inter- hard- that's a really interesting point, actually, because what you're referring to, correct me if I'm wrong, is, is in acting the danger of being typecast. Right. Well, see, Cause if you double edged sword with typecasting, right. Yeah. Um, because specialization does not mean that you are one dimensional, right? Because right, 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 because right, when right. you when you um, when you are a specialist, it doesn't mean that you that you only have one skill. When you're a specialist, it means that you have a unique combination of skills, <laughs> which are deployed yes. in a particular yeah. domain. That's what makes gotcha. you unique. Um, so I like that. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Uh, I think this is great because this is, and, and, and what you said before is, is really relevant in terms of fluff and, and motivational speak. Like yeah. the, 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 these, these points are not here to, to motivate you that they're, they're here to actually give you tools. Yes. Um, one of the things that I always struggled with in terms of, um, and I, I spoke about this, spoke about this. I, um, I don't often do a lot of commentary on, on posts on Facebook and what have you, but I felt I needed to chime in on this one and, and, and it circles back. Yeah. But years ago when I was struggling with saving money and, and mm. understanding why I was so terrible with it, when both my parents are incredible at saving money, And they're like, just, you know, you just need to cut shit out and you need to do this, you need to do this and you'll save money. And I had a life coach at the time and she's like, yeah, I can tell you all the motivational things in the world and and, and those things are right, but you need the tools in order to understand why you don't save money. (laughs) Yeah. And, you know, and why with all of the knowledge that is presented and all the examples Mm. that are presented to you, you're still wasting money and throwing it away. Yeah. And that's a psychology. And so we need to get down and and recalibrate the way that you think about money. Yeah. And it turned out that I just didn't believe that I deserved it. There you go. And you know, and and once I was to able to reprogram that thought process, I, I'm the first to admit that I'm still not amazing at it, but um I'm a hell of a lot better than I was. Mm. Uh but I also make about 50 percent less than what i was making (laughs) at that time too so maybe if i was as good as i am now and i was still in that old job i'd be a lot better off but (laughs) but i wouldn't i wouldn't be as as fulfilled with with what i do but but so someone posted a um an article uh recent actually i know who it was was marnie hill who's um someone I, i i speak with a lot about acting and she used to be with an agency that I was represented with and I'm going to start doing specialized Big Wonder episodes for her yeah. Facebook group, which is designed to educate and help and empower actors. Yeah. Um, but anyway, someone posted a post with an article in whatever, a magazine or a, or a blog or whatever here in Australia with one of our sort of more established actresses. I forget her name. She's not international as far as I'm aware, but she's been working yeah. here in Australia since forever. But she should be a little bit older than me. Um, but anyways, it was it was saying, you know, like um, that this whole shutdown and, and the shutdown of the industry is going to um, put all of our actors out of work and they'll mm-hmm. be on the breadline and, um, it, you know, it's going to wipe out a, a young or a, a generation of actors and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, well, hold on a sec. And I read the article a little bit more and it was talking about how she's single, she's got two kids. And although people understand that, you know, a decent acting job is a relatively high paying mm-hmm. gig, you know, if you're a season, if you're a, a series regular or something like that, you're 
you're going to be making really relatively good money, but they might be yeah. few and far between. And, so, and, and, I, and I responded to this post and I said, if I get what she is saying and because they were, the, the, the issue was is that they were up in arms about that they weren't entitled to the government benefit that mm. might come through um, since all yeah. this has gone down, um, which I understand as as a, as a, as an across the board um should have you know mandatory thing that 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 the art the artist sector should be entitled to this because mm. we need the arts and that's bullshit that that um they don't but but I did feel like this article was you know a bit like poor you and and I was like well hold on a sec if you're an established well-known because that was yeah. the, the headline actress or actor in 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 anywhere 20 years into the business i'd like to think that you'd set yourself up a little bit better than to not be able to survive three months <laughs> job and 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 be needing and and be needing a hand yeah from the government you know yeah uh, um and and not only that to say that this this was other actors were well-known actors were chiming into this conversation saying that the that, that, that this is going to knock out a generation of mm. of hidden talent and i was like mm, i feel like if anything this is going to knock out a, a um a band of people who don't have the grit that is required for this industry mm. and they will and they will open it up to the people yeah. that do and which is so is beneficial you know because these are the kinds of things that really put um, validity to the statement. It's a marathon, mm. not a sprint. Yeah. Um, and this woman chimed up and she's like, yeah, but you know, she's only got two gigs a year and she's got two kids. Yeah. It's really tough. And rah, rah, rah. And I was, like, I was like, I agree. But, but so what I'm saying is, and I, I've missed a part of what my post said is that I, as a creative understand that I have a bad relationship mm. with money and it took me, to, to, took me getting psychotherapy to understand yeah. why and to learn how to turn it around and that it is something that most creatives share mm. as a common denominator is that we're shit with cash <laughs> and why is that and that there should be more information i mean yeah. there's plenty but but it's not preached as often by other creatives on how to wrap your head around cash where to turn where to look and how to cognitively reprogram the way that we creators yeah. think about money oh man um and so so someone there's so much yeah. to unpack there i mean we could do and maybe we should do an entire podcast just on that topic because it's such a big deal um so what i would say like about the this uh, this this lady who's you know on the surface relatively successful and you know and doing lots of big acting gigs well look it doesn't matter whether you are an actor or an investment banker if if your lifestyle is basically fueled by debt then as soon as your income is shut off, unless you have a large right. amount of savings in cash, you are fucked. You are fucked. Because there's a lot of people who are, you know, driving around in fast cars, you have big houses, living, living sort of very high-end lifestyles. And that's, that's, to well, I mean, it's, okay again i'm using this sketch beyond their means well it's they have okay as long as they have income but the thing is that if they mm. don't have any any kind of um cushion to sustain that lifestyle for at least three to six months if the income gets shut off for whatever reason if they can't work for any reason um it doesn't have to be a pandemic it could be illness or some other sort of big life life event then you know you're in big big trouble and that is why business 101 
one of the first things you learn is have a cash reserve for at least three months, ideally six. I haven't always done it. I learned this the fucking hard way, but it really is absolutely essential. It doesn't matter whether it's good times, bad times, whatever, you have to have that, that reserve. Um, and part of the problem is that we never get taught that. We don't get taught it in school. We don't get taught how to, how to manage money in school. Um, my experience has been that people who have parents who are very good with money, are they can go two ways. Like sometimes they're also very good with money and sometimes they're absolutely terrible with money. Um, but it is a, I think a learnable skill. Um, I don't claim to be a master of it, but it certainly got a lot better over the years. And one of the things that's taught me is being, being in a situation where I knew that nobody was going to bail me out. Um, and mm. you know, like that, that can be a really humbling situation to be in when, you know, you're down, on, basically down on your knees and you're like, mm. I need, I need, I need to firstly get out of this situation, and secondly, make smarter moves next time so that this doesn't happen again. Mm. Yeah, um, but it's it, it's interesting and also really sad that you're seeing lots of people and lots of small businesses, and lots of freelancers going bust, not within months, but within days, in some cases. Mm. Yeah. Um, now, obviously, I have massive um, empathy for them because you know not everybody is is in a is is in a privileged position, and you know there are people in places like India who are technically freelancers, but they are literally living hand to mouth, so they have to go out on the streets every day and you know mm -hmm. sell things in order to be able to sort of make ends meet. Um, but uh, but even in more uh, in, in in countries that are in richer countries, you know, where people you'd think they'd have a stronger baseline, some cases within within two weeks or less, they're having to having to sign up for benefits, and I think that says a lot about the level of financial education in in society, not just among creatives. When it comes mm. to creatives, I totally agree that generally they are not not very good at money. And I think that's partly down to the level of financial education, but it's also because we create because it's an urge. It's, it's something that you just do. Something that you just do. Um, whereas if you go into investment banking, there's a good chance that you're doing so because you wanna make a lot of money. So the motivations, the motivations are different. Of course, there's other reasons why you might want to go into investment banking, but but um, no nobody nobody becomes an artist because they want to make a lot of money. They do it because it's a thing that they just have to do, right? I mean, I would. That's right. Yeah. So when the money comes along, they don't not cherish it. Sometimes they do, but very often they don't. Um, the other thing is that they they are because they are motivated to create by this inner fire and not because of the money they don't take a sort of um uh when they when they're thinking about the money they don't take the they don't take enough emotion out of the equation to be able to strategically evaluate whether they are actually charging enough because that's another big problem is that creatives do not charge what they are worth. Mm. But, but, but uh, yes, I agree. But also how many times have you heard of high profile, either A-list actors yeah. or musicians? Oh, a lot. <laughs> and it's like, what the yeah. fuck are you yeah. doing? You know, like how, how is it that you need a bailout even with your royalties that are still coming in? Like, Jesus Christ, move out of the mansion. Get a fucking apartment. Do you know what I mean? Chill mm. out for a sec. Like it, it because there's the there is a much deeper internal yeah. issue going on. Um Yeah, I think, so, I think I mean that you're right. I think we should do an yeah. entire podcast. Yeah, yeah, I think it would be interesting. I really you've you've reminded me and I 
it, uh, I'm the likelihood of it happening. I I think is probably pretty slim. But there's a guy here called Scott Pape, and he has written a best-selling book called The Barefoot Investor. And it's, oh, I think you know, I've heard I of I that. Read a, a mouth yeah. of book. Right. It's very very successful book. It's incredibly well laid out. Um, he's just one of those people who has that very unique ability about being able to lay out what w we as people who are bad with money deem to be complex and mm. make it simple and with also comedy. He's very funny, um, but very intelligent and, a, and yeah. a great writer. And I would love to get him on the podcast to talk specifically to yeah. creatives and to try and merge the two yeah, things, yeah, yeah. you know, in terms of what's happening inside the brain of it. Because we as creatives sort of hold it on as a banner too, a bit like, well, I'm not going to ever be good at money. That's that's part of the deal about being creative. You know, that's 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 one of the, the, the character traits. So fuck it, you know, you don't understand me. You don't know what it's like to be me as a creative. I'm never going to be good with money. Just make it easy, you know, like. No, nah, you've got to you've got to go internal, man, and and believe that you have a choice, that you can change that part of you mm. and make it better. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think we, we, it does. Kind of work. It does. Yeah, yeah. But the mindset around money is like probably the most important thing. Totally, totally. And I think it's like you said before, we're not taught money in the way that we should be at school, and there's a lack of understanding about what money mm -hmm. really is, how to, how to hold on to it. How also, also I think how to not be influenced by every fucking advertising campaign that yeah. you see and buying. Yeah, shit yeah, you yeah. don't need. You really don't need. And one of the things that happens if you're at all self-aware and invested in growing I don't want to say spiritually, but emotionally empowering yourself is you're less affected because you're a happier, mm. grounded person and you're not looking for dopamine hits from purchases yeah. and what have you. Um, I certainly, one of the, 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 probably the biggest move that I made when I started to wrap my head around um, money, well, a couple of things happened. And unfortunately, I got landed in a ton of debt at the same time that I paid off all of my debt was I got made redundant from my mm. oil and gas job. And I had just bought a car and I had just been accepted into acting school in Melbourne and I was living in Perth. So I had to re-inject myself into a shit ton of debt in order to go to acting school and survive without a job. Yeah, all this kind of stuff when I had just gotten out of it. But one of the things that I stopped doing that helped really contain my spending was just to stop buying clothes. Yeah. It was just as simple as just focusing on, on yeah. that one thing. Because when I was working all in gas, I'd get off the boat and I'd spend a thousand dollars on clothes. You know, like I'd have twenty two yeah. grand in my bank, you know, after five weeks of, of going to sea and I had three months off. So I would just go and flush the wardrobe, you know, and or go and buy a new guitar or fucking a two weeks of $200 dinners every night with wine and shit like that, you know. So all of that mm. got culled and, um, you know, starting to shop at like budget liquor places if I wanted booze on the weekend and getting a $5 bottle of a liter of wine, which is yeah. actually palatable as opposed to a $50 of wine because I yeah. want to be fancy. <laughs> I mean, those are extreme examples, but then I, and then, so now I haven't bought new clothes, honestly, like sort of upmarket or even remotely upmarket clothes in right. the last five years. Yeah. Everything that, like everything that I'm wearing now is from a sample sale and it cost me five to $10. Each. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> you know I mean? And it forces you to just, pull back a few layers and only shop because when you see a 75 percent off sale you go wow there's a decent margin there i don't have to pay full price yeah ever well another way of looking at another way of yeah, looking at it is to see the regular price 
as being a premium on the sale price. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and, and just just spend a little time. Just hunt yeah. around. You know what I mean? Like everything that you see in the shop, you can probably find online. Sorry, guys, in the retail world, but it's yeah. too fucking bad. You can find cheaper online. Yeah, you know? yeah. Another little trick I learned recently is um, when you spot something online that you fancy buying, download the image of it and then do a reverse image search and see where else that same product is on sale because chances are it's being banged out en masse in some factory somewhere and being distributed through various channels, some of which might be cheaper than the place where you found it originally. So... So much stuff you can do. Totally, yeah. Totally. Um, there's, there's heaps. And there's, there's people like um, Timothy Ferris who've, who, have, who have built businesses or, 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 you know, around finding every single fucking loophole that there is and touring around the world on points and discounts and vouchers and clubs that they've enrolled yeah. into. It, like... Um, if you've got the the will and the energy, you, you can. I mean, influencers are prime examples. They they put a, a mountain of energy into taking photos of themselves, and now they're invited to wear and dine and travel here, yeah. all paid. You know, if you just get that get that million followers. Um, yeah. So, what? I mean, we, we won't we won't go on too much further, but that's going to come out. Um, hopefully by the time this goes to air next week and what's the next thing what is your eye set now um well you know this this time this lockdown period it's it's a strange time don't get me wrong um but speaking purely for myself um whilst I am very concerned about what's happening globally. It is actually a period that I am, if I'm honest, I'm actually quite enjoying it. Um, I'm enjoying the simplicity of things and having more time to, for example, write and read and work on new new ideas. Um, I think... The next thing that I really want to sink my teeth into is doing a, a proper book. So I have a few a few ideas. Um, I've done I've done an ebook now, right. but I've wanted to do a book for a long, long time, and uh, I've never never. I don't like to say I don't have time. I've never made it a priority, you know, because there's certain there are certain things yeah. in my life, yeah. like for example, my judo or jujitsu training. That's something that I always do, no matter what. I always make time for those things. Yeah. And now, I think you just hit the. Sorry, I just, I just want to. Sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry. I just want to say, I love the way that you put that because lots of people don't use that structure of what's really actually yeah. happening, and that is yeah. priorities. And it, it, it is a matter of priorities. It's not a matter of being time poor. Mm. It's a matter of. What yeah matters most yeah exactly yeah um yeah and now i have a, a very simple life um there's only sort of two or three things that i do in a typical day was normally my schedule is absolutely packed with stuff and this period has made me realize that yeah a lot of it is very interesting but i can live without a lot of it as well um and so i'm quite mm -hmm. i'm learning a lot from having you know just a much much more sim simplified life so doing more writing and being able to just put down a lot of my experiences and thoughts over the last several years down on on paper that's something which now is a very high priority um yeah i was also uh thinking about recording this experience in some way um whether it's through film or maybe even stills photography because it's just so weird like have empty streets and things being closed and trains going by with no passengers mm. and I, I don't think we're well I hope we're never going to see anything like this again um but it is quite 
visually fascinating and, and as a as a visual storyteller i i would like to do something on that front so watch this space yeah, I'm intrigued to see what you do, and 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 I don't. Um, I say this just as a, your your mate and as as another creative. It is what every, not every, but a lot of creatives are looking to do in this time, is make their creative investments about mm. what's happening, um, which is interesting because for me personally, it couldn't yeah. go further from it. Um thinking about all kinds of stuff that mm. has nothing to yeah. do with this. Um, it could, and someone said, I saw something, a quick little snippet. Why the fuck would I want to watch a film made about what's <laughs> yeah. happening now? now? <laughs> you know, like, yeah. I've seen it enough. Yeah, I get that. I get that. I get that. I get that. And I'm, I'm quite, yeah. And not, yeah. That's not to say that what you're doing yeah. is not original. No, no, I think I'm that's, a, but I do think all. that's a very important um, point because, because, if you're not careful, it can end up just being a kind of um, uh, almost this kind of narcissistic endeavor. Um, you know, 100%. that that's why. So, OK, so this ebook that I've written, yes, it's about it's about the pandemic, but more importantly, it's it's an outward looking yeah, right. thing. It's an outward looking thing mm. that hopefully will have value after the 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 pandemic is over. Um, you know, mm -hmm. so yeah, I don't want to get engage in too much navel gazing. Well, I, I'll do that for myself, but I don't expect <laughs> I don't expect anybody else to be all that interested in that. Um, and I think you you sort of touched yeah. on this that there is a risk that if you're sort of doing stuff creatively about the pandemic, that you just we just hit a kind of saturation point. Uh, it's like oh, fuck, you know, another thing about the pandemic. I'm bored with that. I want to, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. so there's 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 your there's your angle. There's your specificity. There's your um particular skill set is finding the untouched earth inside of mm. this time creatively. yeah well i i hope so <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh i think you're the man for the job man hey tom i reckon we're reckon all we're right all yeah there. it's been great talking to you man <laughs> hey man as always and i'm really stoked that you're you're my first yeah <laughs> thanks for the um all 24 hours it's taken us <laughs> to actually get all the tech yeah this and, and, and spending the time because it's it really is labor intensive to shoot it this way but i'm glad that we do we have because i think yeah i mean i know just by watching the skype conversation and listening to the skype sound that it's going to be infinitely better than if we had just recorded that yeah yeah i think so i think so yeah good stuff yeah. all right all right buddy take care love you work. all right you too thanks see man. ya bye, bye.